I do acknowledge that we sin. I acknowledge that some of us need punishment and things to come into our life because of what we've done. But Father, mostly I come before you today to just praise you and thank you for who you are as God. And I thank you for your word. I thank you for the direction it gives to us. And Father, I would just pray that we would seek fidelity with you. That you would just give us a joy of following you and knowing you and having a relationship with you. I ask that you would come and bless this service today. Open your word up to us. Soften our hearts that we could express our love to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.
It's not good for us. Uh, just as an example, um, I always try to keep some kind of treat in my house for my grandkids. And so a couple weeks ago, I went to the store and I bought Peeps. <laughs> peeps. And I, I'll, I'll be darned, they do not have just normal Peeps anymore. You can't just go down and buy a yellow Peep. you got to buy different colors and different flavors. And while I'm not begrudging that, oh my gosh, it's so much harder to make a decision now. Unless you're like me, you just buy one of each. And so I, I had a bag, all in a bag, and the kids came over, and they, Ooh, we got peeps. And, and, and what did they want? They wanted the peeps. And they were not happy with me when I said they could have two. How many did they want? All of them. Every one of them. They wanted all the peeps. Now, being concerned for their welfare, I ate the rest. <laughs> I'm looking out for my grandkids. No, that's not true. I didn't. Um, I've, still, I've actually got two and a half boxes still at the house, which kids will be eating today. But we have in our nature, we have things that we desire that are not good for us. That was why part of why God wrote this and, and has so carefully guarded this to present to us that we might know those things that are not just bad for us, but the things that are good for us. Okay? So um, there will continue to be false teaching that comes out. Uh, I've shared this, this illustration with you before, but when uh, they are teaching people to identify... Um, I just lost the word. It's a dollar bill, but it's not a dollar bill. What do you call that? What? Counterfeit. counterfeit. That's the word. Counterfeit. When they are teaching people to identify counterfeit bills, they actually, during the entire course, they never have them touch or see a counterfeit bill. You know why? Because their philosophy is, if you can see and know and feel the real thing, you'll be much quicker to identify the wrong thing, the fake. And because there are always going to be different ways that people are going to falsify and counterfeit these bills. So they just, they're like, we're not going to be able to cover all the different things that happen. But what we can do is show you what the real thing looks like. And that's what we are about. We want you to hold on to what the real thing is. No counterfeits. The real deal. So we're just going to touch on a couple of these things. This illustration up here is through course, uh, throughout the history of the church, this is the best illustration that we have been able to come up with. And I say we, I was not there. Uh, it was actually a little bit before my time. So um, this is the best illustration to demonstrate to us what our position is on the Trinity. And if you look, you see in the center is God. All right, and then on the outside, there are three positions, three persons. And if you see, all three of them are God. You see the Father, you see the Son, you see the Holy Spirit. All three of them are God. But you notice there is only one God. Okay? But then we look at the outside edge and we see what they are not. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Holy Spirit nor the Father. The Holy Spirit is neither the Father nor the Son. So we see that there are three persons that comprise one God. Now, I, again, I cannot stress this enough to you. We have finite minds. We tend to think very linearly. Okay? We have a hard time thinking outside of of the dimensions that we exist in. The three dimensions plus time. And, and honestly, some of us really struggle with the dimension of time. Okay? Um, so, I, I once heard a, a pastor talking about God, and, and he made this statement that I was actually mowing my lawn, and I had my headphones in, I was listening to this message, and he made a statement that actually made me stop and turn off the engine and ponder. I guess I don't ponder well with the engine on. But I stopped and I started pondering. And one of the things that he said was that, you know, we say that God can do anything, but we know there are certain things that God cannot do. One, God cannot tell a lie. 
I agree with that. Absolutely. The truth. God is the truth. God is what defines the truth. The truth does not define God. Okay? Just like love. God defines love. Love does not define God. These are attributes of his character and his nature. But one of the things that he said that I absolutely disagree with is God could not fit a square peg in a round hole. And so I turned off the motor and I pondered this. I cannot, without altering either the hole or the peg, I cannot put a square peg in a round hole. And I would imagine most of you could not as well. Okay? But part of the reason that that doesn't work for us is because we are stuck in three dimensions, specifically as relates to this. Okay? Now, I'm going to ask you kind of a trick question. What is the majority of our body comprised of? Water. Water. Wrong. <laughs> space. The majority of our bodies is space. If you were to look at the um, uh, an atom, as small as they are, the majority of what an atom is, is space. Okay? And it's got its neurons, it's got its neutrons, it's got its electrons. But all of these things, if you take it and you put it into a scope and you look at it, more than the neutron, the electron, and the proton, proton yeah, more than that, there's space. Okay? And so we've, we've talked about this in the brothers' meeting, we've talked about it in a couple of the other Bible studies. Uh, when Jesus was resurrected, we say that he had a glorified body. He was able to do things that most of us can't do. I would say all of us, but uh, one of these days I think we will be able to do. Jesus was able to appear in the midst of the disciples while they were in a room that was locked. He went from the outside to the inside. How is that even possible? Can any of us do that? If uh, Let's just say I was to put you guys on the outside and lock the doors both of them, and assuming you did not break the windows, would you be able to get inside? Well, if you had a key, you could. Right? If you had a key, you could unlock the door and you could get in. I think what Jesus had was he had the key. Alright? Now I'm really going to bend your brain. Alright? I'm, I'm not by any means saying that I'm an expert in this and I'm an amateur, but I've listened to people that are experts in this and, and I'm just relaying to you what they say. Alright? We believe currently that there are up to at least 10 dimensions. The problem with that is we can only see a certain number of them and we can't see the others. Does anybody here know about string theory? Yes. Anybody? Okay. The idea behind string theory is that everything in the universe that is, is made up of strings of different size, different lengths, different types. And these strings vibrate at certain uh, frequencies, frequencies and, and they are what make everything up. The problem with this is, is we have not discovered the means to be able to focus in enough to actually see the strings. So the string theory is not based on something we can see, but it's based on something that we can. We can see the strings vibrating, what that effect is to things around them. All right? For example, for us laymen, if you were to look outside, how could you tell whether or not the, the wind was blowing? Trees could you see the wind? No, we can't see the wind. What? You can feel it. You can feel it. Well, hopefully not if you're inside and it's outside. I guess the window could be open. I thought you were saying outside. Yeah, well, but we can see, not the wind, but we can see the effects of the wind, right? You know, some days you can see that, you know, the bushes and the leaves are blowing, and other days you can see the people and the dogs are blowing, and uh, occasionally the cars blow. So um, we can see the effect of wind, so we can see the effect of strings, and that's why people posit that there are strings, and, and that's the, 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 the deepest level that we've gotten to. All right, now... <clears throat> One of the things that we struggle with is because we are stuck with these limited dimensions, we have a hard time understanding what is beyond that. 
Now, if you take with, if, if you understand that the majority of what makes us up is space, and the majority of what makes up that wall is space, and you are no longer limited to three dimensions, but you can go five, six, seven, eight, then it becomes realistically plausible that a human, even though we're solid, could pass through a wall. Now, I don't think any human here today can do that, not without putting a hole in the wall. All right? But I think Jesus, in his glorified state, is able to pass through a wall just like we would pass through a doorway. Now, why do I say all this? I'm not, I'm not here to teach you a lesson about science. I'm saying this as an illustration because there are certain things that by the, the, the definition of who we are and what we are, we can't grasp. All right? The Trinity is something that I do not believe this side of heaven we will fully be able to grasp. It's a mystery. It is a part of an infinite God that a finite being cannot grasp. And that actually gives me comfort. Okay? Remember my t-shirt that I used to have? You know, two things in this life for sure. One, there is a God. And two, you're not him. The back side of that shirt said, if God were small enough to fit in your mind, he would not be big enough to handle your problems. Okay? I want a God that is beyond what I can do. I don't want a God that I can get all the answers to. I don't want a God that merely exists in what I can understand. Because you know what? Even with all the understanding that I have today, there's a lot I don't understand. Tope. Tope. You can laugh all you want. I have had people point it out to me and tell me that's taupe. What's taupe? The color. The color. That's my point. It's a light pink. I think that is one of the fundamental differences between okay. men and women. Men see in 16 colors. <laughs> and thank God for ish. <laughs> okay. Women, they see in colors that you know, I don't know, it's pinkish. Oh no, that's, that's a whatever word you guys make up to describe it. Okay? Um, but fundamentally, if I could understand all that there was to understand about God, He would not be God and I would not be less than God. Okay? The mystery of the Trinity is one of those things that I actually cling to that my God is greater than I am. That my God is greater than this place that I live, this country, this world. That, that the God that I believe in is honest and true when he says that he measures out the universe with the span of his hand. He knows all the stars and he calls them all by name. And every year we are finding more and more and more stars. And yet he knows them all. He knows the very number of the hair on our head. I'm just making it easy for us. <laughs> all right? Some of you guys, not so much. All right? So, one of the things that we need to understand is we're not going to have a complete understanding of this, this side of heaven. All right? So, just some passages that I want to give to you. These are things that support our belief that there is one God. This is the Shema. This is, uh, and, and if you want um, a copy of my notes, I'll be happy to give you a copy of my notes. I can't give it to you today because I, I scrawled some notes that you're not allowed to see on my message. So um, there is one God, the Shema. Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. <coughs> 1 Corinthians 8, 4. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. Galatians 3.20. Galatians 3.20. Now, an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Okay? So we see
see that, and we talked last week, we talked about the words that are used to describe God throughout the Old Testament. Um, we, we looked a little bit into Elohim. Um, we, we looked into Echad. Uh, and and we, we understand that in the Hebrew language, when God refers to himself as we, or he is put forth as God, the word Elohim means more than one. And Echad is even more unique because it means more than one, but it also means more than two. Okay? So when you see in Scripture, that in, in the Hebrew Scriptures, you see that God is describing himself, and what might be a good point for you to go and look up what that word is, because there are times when God specifically uses a word that by its definition requires at least three, but the three are comprising one being. Okay? The three make one. I'm not going to get into examples. Uh, if you want to see that video that I tried to show last week that was kind of hard to hear. Um, there are too many wrong teachings of people trying to understand this mystery. And we, we see... The, the fallacy of modalism, we see the fallacy, the heresy of Arianism, and this, I don't believe the men started on this journey to create a heresy, I think they started on this journey to try and understand, okay? I, I think they uh, got to a point where they were like, I, I'm trying to put into words something that there are insufficient words for, all right? So, um, we see that there is one God, um, but, uh, throughout scripture, we see that this God is represented in three persons. These three persons are uniquely identified as being a part of God, but not one another. So God the Father. Just touch this real quick. Um, John chapter 6 verse 27. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you for on him, God the Father has set his seal. Okay? Now, interestingly enough, this is also a passage that you can use to determine that there are three aspects of God. God the Son, God the Father, and the seal that is God the Holy Spirit. Uh, Romans 1.7 To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 1, 2, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for the sprinkling with His blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. All right, so in the New Testament, we see a clearly defined person of God the Father. God the Son, did we go back to this, one of these days I'm gonna show you another video of uh, Donald and Connell talking about this passage. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, we take that to understand that because there's a differentiation between the Word and God, there has to be an aspect that we are not getting. That is actually handled just a couple verses later as John continues his Gospel. So, um, John 1, 14, so just uh, 13 verses later, speaking of the Word, said, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So we see that, that Jesus is the Word, and He is identified as a person separate to but connected with the Father. Romans 9, 5. To them belong the patriarchs. This is Paul talking about Israel. He says, To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ who is God. The Christ being Jesus. Hebrews 1, verse 8. Chapter 1, verse 8. But of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. So, we see the separate identification of the Father and the Son, both being described as people, as, as persons, but they are not 
each other. They are a part of the whole. All right? So, the Spirit. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And some people say, well, that could just that could be the God the Father. If it were God the Father, then why did they need to add spirit? Why did they need to differentiate? Why did they need to qualify the spirit of God? Okay, so right at the beginning, we see already a duality, at least, in the Godhead. Um, Acts chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. Uh, this is Peter talking to Ananias. He says, uh, Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? And he goes through it. He talks about where the lie was and what happened. And then as he wraps up his message to Ananias, he says, you have not lied to man, but to God. And we see that, that, that Peter here is differentiating between the Holy Spirit and but he is still including the Spirit in the aspect of God. All right? Um, so, God exists eternally as one God in three persons. But there are no other gods. Now, I actually have a, a friend of ours. Um, he's got some very interesting ideology, and I can understand where he's got, uh, where, how he's arrived where he has. But he believes that there are many gods. We see throughout Scripture, we see the gods of the Philistines, the gods of the Egyptians, the gods of the Canaanites, the gods of the Babylonians and the Assyrians and the Hittites, and we see all these, these plethora of, of gods, and yet we look in Scripture and we see uh, over and over again that God says there is one God. There were no gods before me. There will be no gods after me. There are no gods beside me. How does that then qualify if Jesus is God and the Holy Spirit is God, but God's Word is telling us that there is one God? Again, the, the Hebrew being used implies there must be a plural, and that plural must exist in three or more. Okay? There is only one God. Absolutely. But He exists in three persons. Here's the biggest problem that I've seen with this theology, where most of the false teaching comes from. We don't understand. We're limited in being able to understand. Here's the thing, folks. The smartest men in history have come to things that they could not give an answer for. Or they attempt to give an answer only to find that through other different uh, experiences, their answer is incorrect. The problem is we are very limited in our ability to understand. And that, that exists in two fold, actually three. We're limited in, in our ability to understand because we have a certain amount of time on this earth. Okay? And we're not going to be able to get to see everything. Two, we are limited in our capacity to learn. Uh, did everybody here know what an IQ is? Yes. Does anybody here know what your IQ is? Yes. Um, so I heard somebody say yes. Brian, what's your IQ? 136. 136. Was that on the Stanford Binet? Yes. Okay. Um, 136. Here's, does anybody know what IQ means? Intelligence quotient. Wonderful. Intelligence quotient. But well, what does it mean? It's your ability to learn. Exactly. Here's the thing. The test itself is flawed. Okay? There are a number of different tests. There's the uh, Binet, the Stanford Binet, the Slossler. There's a bunch of different tests that you can take. The problem is that each of these tests is predicated that you know something. Okay? A lot of the tests will, will ask you on, on questions of knowledge that you must have to be able to answer correctly. One of the greatest examples that I, I was shown of this was they brought a girl from South Korea. She was a genius. Uh, she had already figured out math problems that I, I don't even understand. You know, they say math, and I'm like, I'm out. All right? And she had already solved these math problems. But they gave her, here in the U.S., they gave her an intelligence test. And she came up as being below average. Why? 
Because the words that we use in America are not the same words that they use in South Korea. She was limited in her knowledge based on the test that was given. If they had been able to take the same test and, and pass it through a filter and bring it out the other side, South Korean, she would have been a genius. So what's true? Did she really only get average intelligence? No, she got average knowledge. Not intelligence. Okay? The whole point of an intelligence test is to be able to appreciate and define your ability to learn new things. Okay? How easily you are able to learn things. And people put a whole lot more invested interest in this than, than it really it deserves. I know a lot of people that have IQs that are way above mine that are doing absolutely nothing with it. I know people that have IQs that are significantly lower than mine, but man, they are a success in this life. Okay? So, so when somebody says, oh, you know, I've got an IQ of this, I've got an IQ of that, um, okay, that's great. What are you doing with it? What are you doing with it? You know? Um, that's like those guys that spend hours and hours and hours a day pumping iron and they, got big, they can't even put their arms down. You know? so, wow, okay, you've got big muscles. What are you doing with it? You know? What, 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 you got it, what do you do with it? I just look awesome. <laughs> okay. Alright. Okay, so. We struggle to understand um, because of time, because of our ability to learn, and, and the last thing is we just don't have enough time in the life that we have to experience everything. We're limited on our ability to experience. Um, one of the things, that, an example of this that I went through years ago, there was a movie uh, that was everybody was saying, oh, it's the greatest movie ever. It was incredible. You needed to watch it. Uh, it was called Lost in Translation. Anybody here see that, Bill Murray? I'm going to recommend you don't. Um, it, 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 the movie has to be really bad for me to, to not be able to get all the way through the movie. And, and it wasn't bad in that, you know, because I don't watch movie that has nudity and, and, and things of a sexual nature. I just don't even watch those. Um, but but um, I couldn't get through this movie. I, I, there was a scene that was about two minutes or so, and all it showed was Bill Murray sitting in the back of a taxi staring out a window. And then he got to his hotel, and he went in his room, and he sat on the bed. Oops, not the bottom of the bed. And he stared. I'm just not that much into art. <laughs> I really, I'm not. Who wants to see me? Um, but my point is, there are a lot of, I mean, I, I dare say there's nobody here that has seen every movie that's ever been. Come here. Come here. Woohoo! We just can't experience everything we need to experience. Even if you could experience everything that, you, that, that there is to experience, your brain's not big enough to understand it all. Okay? So, three things that I want to exist to take away from this. One, there is one God. There is only one. That God is eternally existent in three persons, all of whom were involved in the creation of all things, all of whom are involved in the sustaining of all things. Okay? So God is one. He exists eternally and co-equally in three parts. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Three, the third thing I want you to take away from this is God has given us everything that we need to be able to grasp this in his word, but we're never going to be able to fully understand it. Okay? So when somebody comes to you and they want to throw a roadblock in front of you and try and trip you up with the Trinity, there's a lot of things in this world that we don't understand. Why do we think that we can understand the creator of all those things?